Good morning, Rob Rebar. I'm doing excellent. <laughs> How are you? I am doing great. Super excited to hear from our speakers, including our amazing sponsors, Expedia Group and Meta later today. And then you can check out Expedia Group, Esri and Culture Amp tomorrow at our virtual job fair. So if you're in the market for a new role, be sure to take a look at all of them. But I'm very excited, actually, Hunter, about our first speaker today because it's you. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Well, people who have been coming to our Diversity Reboot Summit, as well as many of our other events, will certainly know you as an excellent moderator. But what they don't probably know is that you are really become a true AI expert. <laughs> and you're done deep into the world of AI. So I'm really excited to talk to you further about that subject because it's, of course, the two letters that are on everybody's lips these days. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, I love an acronym and alliteration. So your neat insights today. And yes, AI did help me come up with that. But it was a back and forth collaboration uh, for our neuro expansive AI toolkit. But that's what we'll be talking about. How it's like, it didn't just give me that. I We worked together on that and we can jump in. Uh, I just love it. Cause I was like, what are we gonna talk about today? I was like, well, preparing for this talk, I'm doing all of the things. So all I have to do is document what I'm doing and talk about it with Rob. <laughs> yeah, well, like you said, what well, like we say in the description too, sometimes many of us do feel like we are a browser with a hundred tabs open. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and you've gone on a very interesting journey for yourself. So tell us a little bit about your own journey of discovering that you are a member of the neurodiverse community. Yeah, I'm a member and now I'm a happy customer, but it wasn't always like that <laughs> <laughs> because it took, I was late diagnosed in life and I'm talking three in the past three, four years. I've had a lot of things that started to make sense. So in the middle of COVID, actually, I was sharing with someone, someone I, I was talking on an online meeting, actually, and I was sharing with someone how, oh, I was like late to learn how to read in life. And uh, I used to, but I, isn't it funny now that like I'm a performer, I'm an actor, I'm a moderator, so I'm really good at memorizing lines uh, and memorizing speeches and things like that. And someone came up to me after the meeting and they're like, you know, that's a sign of dyslexia, right? I was like, I'm sorry, what? I had no idea. Total stranger, this angel out of nowhere cued me in because it, it was his experience too. He's like, well, yeah, I mean, in my experience, this is very common. As kids, when we're embarrassed because we're late to learn how to read and there's this pressure and then people are just, you know, I'm of a certain age where diagnoses weren't as common. So I was just, I felt dumb. I felt slow. I felt um, left behind. And so the way to cover for that is to read ahead and to memorize the next line. And that's what I was doing unconsciously just to protect my own ego, my own self-esteem, but it developed this skill of reading ahead. So I wouldn't mess up the words as I was speaking out loud. And once this stranger, stranger angel told me this, um, things started to click. And then a year later, after many years of therapy, and, uh, you know, I have a great psychiatrist as well, and a support system, we started to peel back the layers and started to talk with my medical team about focus issues and other things like that. And then when we started to experiment with getting me on the right path to focus, the ADHD symptoms suddenly were like an aha moment. I was like, oh, now that I'm aware of this, now I'm treating this, I under so much of my life is starting to make sense. Like being easily distracted, going down rabbit holes, um, you know, then it's like either super focused on something or completely unfocused on other things. This started to make sense. And once we started to incorporate and find the right tools, uh, and I'm talking about mental health tools, um, that's when my productivity really started to get in line. And then serendipitously, one year later, ChatGBT comes out 
and everything changes. And I jump in head first with these AI tools. And now that I was equipped with understanding how my brain works a little better, it's an ongoing journey. Uh, I could fill in the blanks with some of these AI things that never existed before that then helped me get stuff done and stay on task and express myself in a creative way that I just could never do before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you're certainly not alone. I've heard so many other people of our millennial generation that are only being diagnosed now because people were just not often, that it wasn't even a thought, as you said, when right. we were younger. So I'm glad that that is something now, I think that younger generations can hopefully um, not have that same experience that you had and made to feel the way that you were made to feel by those advancements and technology, which is is great because it also kind of ties into the AI talk because we were saying sometimes you can feel like you have a hundred tabs open, you have a hundred ideas racing mm -hmm. in your mind. Yes. So how can AI help you corral those into something that is hopefully brilliant? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I'll tell you this. It helps me get through the bad ideas a lot quicker. Mm. You know, like that way I can, instead of, instead of spending hours going down a rabbit hole or getting really what used to happen a lot was hitting a wall. You know, like, why can't I just like break through this idea or the writer's block is getting in my way. And I like have this like abstract idea in my head, but I can't get it down on paper because that blinking cursor is staring me in the face and it's triggering me of my childhood when I couldn't type, right? Like we were like, we started our generation too is like the beginning of writing reports on computers. Mm -hmm. We kind of went, went, remember cursive? Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still, I don't do it now and I couldn't do it then, I don't think. <laughs> no, no. My signature is still like a really, really ugly, weird cursive. But other than that, I'm printing all the way and typing. <laughs> So these tools are able to help me get ideas out faster. And now what also is so helpful and the thing that I'm going to talk a lot about, and there's a lot of different use cases for this and deployments of this is voice to speech. Mm. I am a think out loud type of person. I do a lot of typing too, but I can talk and my ideas can flow much faster out of my mouth than out of my fingers. And the new advanced AI voice to speech models, this is not your voice to speech text messaging that we grew up with. And like, why are the words weird or it's censoring certain words or whatever and spelling things wrong and, you know, all that stuff. That's not what this is anymore. And, you know, I felt like with old voice to speech, we were waiting for, we would like, okay, I am going to this thing. And like, it's turning us in, it's turning us into robots. <laughs> you know, like the way we were talking, it was slowing us down. So it wasn't really useful for ideas, for me at least. And now there are so many tools out there. You can do it with chat GPT voice or tools like perplexity, which is a searching tool. All of this stuff is what people are starting to call our multimodal which means it can do a bunch of different things to get the information. You can talk to it, you can type to it, it create images. That's what multimodal means, right? So when I'm talking, I can just speak for 10, 15, 20 minutes, just like I'm talking to you now. And then it'll just be this long, some people call them brain dumps. I think that sounds gross. I prefer <laughs> thought cascades. <laughs> because I'm fancy. And <laughs> <laughs> so I could just talk for like 20 minutes and it will, there's a bunch of tools that can automatically summarize it or turn it into key points or rewrite it. So it's a short story, whatever just gets these ideas out. And then it gives me a new way of looking at my ideas instead of scribbling in a notebook that I can probably not read later because again, my cursive and handwriting sucks. <laughs> now I can just talk, 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 get AI out. It gets the first draft out there and 
off we go. There's so many different mm -hmm. ways I can now incorporate that text. Well, and this is also making me think for the employers who are watching, do you have, for folks who are not working remotely, but working in an office, maybe yeah. it makes sense to have a space where people who learn and create the way that you're describing can really utilize that. So like I know some offices have those kind of phone booth things where you can go in and talk and you're not disturbing the person there. Or if you are not an employer, but you are an employee and what Hunter is saying sounds like you, maybe you want to advocate to your manager and say, hey, there's that empty office over there. Would it be okay if I go in and instead of like sitting at my computer writing, I'm able to do this speech to text? So it's just making me think like these are ideas that people might want to start taking to their teams and utilizing it if you're in a traditional office setting. Yes, I think that's an excellent idea, Rob. I had never thought of that to for people working uh, in offices to utilize an empty office and to go in there and be able to do voice to speech. That is such a genius idea. Mm -hmm. Or those like, like you said, those voice call booths where you can mm -hmm. go in and get this little, I feel like I see them everywhere, like the gray soundproofing. Exactly. I'm like, oh, I, I see where you're at. I, I see one of those. <laughs> Whoever, whatever company made that cleaned up in the past 10 years or whatever. Well, like, oh, here's really another, smart. another great use for it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, exactly. Let's get a little more into how AI can really turn those everyday meh moments into spontaneous aha breakthrough. So what tips do you have for making this magic happen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you haven't used AI yet, the first time you do, it does feel like magic, right? It feels mm -hmm. like this sorcery. You're like, how is this happening? But it it's not magic, but it feels like magic. You know, it's still technology. It still makes mistakes. But um, oh, by the way, Francis says, hello, everyone. I can see he's ready to come off my lap now. <laughs> He's like, get me in the bed. I hate when you're on Zoom because you're not paying attention to me. <laughs> so for to, to use AI tools to help me break through from meh moments to aha moments, there's a bunch of ways I do that every day. So the voice to speech thing is for me, pivotal. That's not going to work for everybody, but I have many friends that are uh, neuro expansive, neurodiverse, and we use this tool a lot and we use it back and forth with each other too. So then like on Slack, we're talking and all of our transcripts are popping up. So I can drop a transcript. Can you hear my dog barking in the back? A little bit. Yeah, but it's uh, okay. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> there's, there's people working outside. The beauties of working from home. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you vamp for a second, Rob. <laughs> Francis, yeah. I mean, I, I've, um, I mean, I've used so much what what kind of my approach to kind of AI has really been in terms of more generative AI it often is I do find that once I produce something myself, so if I'm able to actually kind of write um, an event description or an email, what have you, I'm able to then put that into a uh, generative AI model. And it is able to, I think, take out some of those key ideas yes. that I'm able, because I'm kind of an overwriter often. So I'll just write a mm. lot, but that's not necessarily the best for like sending an email to someone, right? So then right. that AI <laughs> can often say, okay, but you wrote all of this in paragraph form, but if we need to get those three bullet points for the person yes. who doesn't want to read the whole thing. They just want to go to those bullets. And we know a lot of people do that. That's something I've been finding AI. So I think it is a combination. It's not just like AI is doing the work for me. It's I'm doing the work, but then it is taking out. It's co condensing what I'm saying into a few key points. 100%. And I love the, what you're talking about with scannability, because that's really big for folks like me that are ADHD and dyslexic mm -hmm. or a combination of those things, maybe ADDD. ADD that the scanning the bullet points is fantastic and that's the way you know I, I when I emailed you I was like please try to print the description of this as written because I wrote this for scannability for folks mm -hmm. like me and I did come up with that the AI helped me write that and then I look at AI sometimes for uh, us 
neurodiverse folks as a universal translator, like on Star Trek, right? Because I can take something that's written in a certain way and then I can have it reformatted for myself. I can say, hey, here's this article. Can you put it into key takeaways or an executive summary or however you want to do it? I like, I work in Notion a lot. So I'll tell my AI to be like, format this as if it was a Notion document. So then it has like cute emojis for like the titles and like, I can see all of it. So that's a great way that you can do with, if you do it in chat GBT, you can have it change to, like you said, like condensing something, rewriting it. Uh, I love that. And another way is to, uh, for short attention spans for myself, sometimes it can help me, um, let's see, condense it. Like perplexity is a great tool that uh, uses LLMs in the background and then searches uh, the internet, and then it will cite all of your sources for you when you're looking at different things. And then you can have it write it in the way that works best for you as well. I love this. Yeah, there's so there's so many tools there. Uh, but I'm going kind of back to our other idea to this kind of overwhelm idea. Yeah. How can AI help in managing the feelings of being overwhelmed with too many tasks or ideas? Because I do I I, even for myself, I'll find like I'm writing stuff down on a piece of paper. I've got all my right. tabs up. I have Asana or other kind of task management tools. So it's in all yeah. these different places. So how have you found that AI is really helpful in terms of dissipating that overwhelming feeling? And what other strategies can you do to maintain focus? Because like you said, sometimes you see that blinking dot on your computer and right. suddenly your brain is going in all these different directions. And of course, totally. I think the interesting thing is we're talking about technology to help with that. And so many times technology can also be the distractor at the same time. So how do we utilize technology for good in that way? Totally. Well, another thing that's so great about research, no matter what field you're in, what used to take weeks, you can get done in a matter of minutes now. And that's not an exaggeration because it can go out and do all of the searching bring it back to you, then it's like, okay, that helped, that maybe saved me a week. Let's even say mm -hmm. like, maybe that saved me five hours and I did it in five minutes without that research. So now it's like, okay, I have that. The stage where we're at from my point of view with AI right now is there's a lot of different tools and that in itself can feel overwhelming. You're like, what tools do I use to get stuff done? Mm -hmm. Um, and now everyone is rolling AI into their current tools and it's, it can feel still like things are siloed where you start to get fancy. And what's helped me quite a bit are using things that link the tools together and using automations and, you know, things like Zapier, active pieces, make.com. These are really helpful tools that can, that have a bit of a learning curve, but has for me started to connect the dots. So for an example, I use a voice to speech um, tool on my phone that is like a little indie company that I love. And then it has, when that's done, it rewrites it in bullet points automatically. After it does that, it automatically sends it to my notion, which is where I have what I call my second brain over there. And then it will add it to my action items for the day. Or it's just like all of my ideas in one place. Or like after a Zoom call, my note taker automatically sends my notes to my Notion. And then I can talk to my AI to be like, what were the key takeaways from the meeting today? And maybe I had four meetings and I can say, hey, of the four meetings I had today, what should I prioritize? What's top priority, what's medium and what's low? And then that can help me paint out my entire week. The thing that's, th and that's really great. The thing that's challenging right now is that these tools need to be connected. Mm -hmm. And that is not necessarily something you can just like learn like that. The bright side is this is going to become, I think, somewhat irrelevant as a lot of the larger tools are starting to become these full encompassing suites. And they're trying to get you in, you know, with like, Google Gemini, they're rolling it out into all of their tools. Obviously, they're making you pay extra for it. Later next year, Apple Intelligence is coming out. It's going to do a lot of the same stuff, 
where you'll talk to Siri. It'll add it to your second brain and whatever Siri decides that is. It'll put it in your calendar. It's going to start doing that stuff. And I would say that's something to look forward to. So people, the majority of us that don't want to learn all of that stuff, it's just going to be taken care of mm -hmm. in the future. But in the short term, just having, if you keep it simple, sweetheart, as I like to say to myself, just like having a voice to speech thing, maybe with chat GBT, and you talk to it regularly uh, throughout the day and you have your voice notes uh, or your meeting notes from your Otter, your Fathom, your Firefly, whatever meeting note taker. If you're not using meeting note taker, that is like the biggest tool. Whatever one you choose is good because they're all getting great now. That, if you spend a lot of time on Zoom and even Zoom has it built in now, completely changes everything so that you can just be present during a meeting and then not feel overwhelmed that I forgot something. Yeah. And I can just drop in that transcript or even a lot of the tools now, you can just talk right to it and be like, what happened in that meeting? And it'll tell you like, what are Hunter's action items? And it'll just be like that. I was like, oh my gosh, that's great. I don't have yeah. to keep track of everything anymore. Well, it goes back to how we learn differently. Some people might want to watch the recording of a meeting mm -hmm. and get it visually that way. I am not one of those people. I would much rather read a transcript or some notes from that. So I think it's, there's never a one size fits all solution, which is right. something we talk about so often here at Power to Fly. And yes. I think that is what we're kind of seeing with AI, which is also yes. kind of making me think, Hunter, what are some of the biggest myths uh, myths about AI being a productivity superhero and how do we keep our expectations in check while still getting the most out of it? Because sometimes I think we think like, oh, there's you press one button and it's done. But as you're describing, that's definitely not the case. Yeah, it's. I think that is the greatest myth of AI right now is that it's going to do all my work for me. And it's not going to do that. It Because if you just say, do this, and that's a lot of people's experience. The first time they use AI, they tell it to do something and you're like, well, that sucks. That doesn't sound anything like me or that was really generic. And yeah, it's trained on everything on the internet. So it's going to come off generic at first. So it's not going to do your work for you on autopilot yet. Who knows what's around the corner? But right now, that's the greatest myth. Your AI is not going to do your work for you. But I would say... The flip side of that is it helps even playing field for folks that learn differently, that speak differently, that write differently. Maybe English isn't your first language and you're required to write emails in English all the time. Before, maybe you're using something like Google Translate and it kind of came off a little clunky or you're just doing it on your own, which is awesome, but it was still maybe holding you back. Now you can go on so many of the tools, they just be like, write this in French for me. And it's actually good French or vice versa. So that is something that I love that's evening the playing field. And it really helps, like you said, there's no one size fits all. It helps utilize everybody's strengths. So if I want a voice to speech something and then AI rewrites it for me, excellent. And that's one way of doing it. Or maybe it's the other way around where you wanna type things out but it also then can like uplift your vocabulary, your grammar, maybe it's another language that helps even the playing field. I would say also something that is a misconception is that AI is not here to replace us, it's here to help us. And I think there's a lot of concern about job displacement and I think people have a valid reason to be concerned because a lot of jobs are going to change. If you work on a computer, your job is going to change. And this is how I would encourage folks to start playing with the tools, but don't have the expectation that you need to learn everything right now, or you're going to be obsolete. I think that's another false expectation is like, I have to learn everything about AI or I'm going to lose my job and the robots are going to take over my job or someone that knows AI better than me is going to take over my job if I don't learn everything. Don't sweat. Find what is holding you back. I say start in and work your way out. So what's holding me back right now? Is it emails? Is it research? Is it focus during meetings? Just focus on one thing. And then I guarantee you there's an AI tool that's going to help you with that. And just get really, really clear and become an expert in that one tool that improves your day and your flow. 
and just go brick by brick, bird by bird, as Annie Lamont says, just go one step at a time. Because right now there's, you know, for the first year of AI, that was the big boom. I was trying to learn every tool and it was great, but somewhere becoming obsolete before I knew it, right? Now, if a new tool comes out, I take a quick look to be like, is that solving a problem that I need solved? And if not, I'm not going to devote a lot of time to it anymore unless I'm helping someone else. And then I'm like, oh, I at least have an understanding of that tool. Maybe I'll learn a little bit more if I'm like coaching someone on a client that's helping them learn a tool. That's fine. But it's a trap to try to learn everything right now because it's impossible. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, totally. And I think that always, you know, the whole point that we kind of started this conversation with was that overwhelming feeling. And if you're trying to learn everything all at once, you're only exacerbating that more rather than actually using these tools to help you. Right. And I love yeah. kind of being a, a, what's it like a jack of all trades, master of none. Like you're actually yes. advocating to be the master of what one tool. And then from there, you can kind of expand. Yeah. But before we run out of time, I'd love to kind of go back to this kind of sense about creativity. Because as you were mm. saying, we're worried some folks are worried AI is going to take our jobs. I think one of the chief things there is actually creative work, copywriting, art, all those things. But I think at the same time, many people say, actually, no, AI can actually unlock your creativity. Yeah. So especially for people who are listening, who are in creative, or maybe they're not a creative brain and they want to use AI to kind of boost their creativity. What would mm -hmm. you say to them? Totally. How much time do you got? <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> Two minutes. We'll we'll touch well, the the top. I have like another stuff. hour, right, Ron? Exactly. We have another hour to riff on this. <laughs> well, this is a huge, huge conversation. Um, I would say I'm a creative person. I grew up doing creative things: photography, performing, voice acting, on you know, on camera acting. Um, a little bit of graphic design, but I've never been an expert on that. These things, um make it so oh, we got a little screen sharing here yep hi yep. Yep. oops that. hello there you go hi hi Almost there. Rob. nice to meet you <laughs> nice. virtually nice meet you. <laughs> yeah we'll bring you on in just one second okay <laughs> yeah great so um for creatives we need to start embracing these tools and if you have a union talk to your unions because there's people that are like, oh, creatives are overreacting. We're not overreacting. And the lawsuits that are happening right now, I think are very important because the creatives need to fight for their legal rights and for their intellectual property. And it's murky right now. And the more you, as a creative, the more you experiment with these tools, knowledge is power. And you can understand what we're up against and what also we can utilize, because maybe there was a part that was slowing down in your creative work that was slowing you down in creative work that you need to deliver to clients. But now AI can help you get that out a little faster. If you're not a creative person, this is an amazing unlock moment, right? Because now you can go and talk to an image generator and you're like, oh my gosh, I had this idea. And like, there it is, or there's something like it. And then you can riff with it. I say, for the bootstrap folks that can't afford a graphic designer, that's a great way to get stuff off the ground. And that can be pretty solid and pretty good to go. And if you're maybe ideating on something and you do have a budget, it's a great way to do a first draft and bring mm -hmm. it to your creative team and be like, we're thinking about something like this. And then let the creatives do their job with that inspiration. Because a lot of times creatives are trying to respond to a client that doesn't know what they want. But if the client is able to give a little an idea, maybe something that they made with AI to point them in the right direction, that's a win-win. You're going to get your job done. You're going to get the job done faster and the client's going to be happier. And if you, the client, are doing that, you're definitely going to be happier because you're like, oh, I did this with, you know, typing in a prompt. And it was pretty close. But what you did is definitely more specific to what I wanted. So that would be my... One minute hot take. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I, it's it's like taking things like we had mood boards, word clouds, all these things that we have had for so long. And I think 
infusing technology into them. So as you said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We could do a whole session on this. In fact, Hunter did sit down and talk to us about AI at our June summit. So go back and watch that. And I know there will be more talks coming up. But thank you so much, Hunter, for sharing your own story and also these amazing tools. I know Michelle is on the line, so we're super excited to turn things over to you, Hunter, for this next talk. And everyone else, enjoy the rest of today's event. Uh, we'll see you later. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. And just to wrap up that last talk, thank you so much, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to share a bit about my story. I love interviewing folks and keeping the conversations going with folks here at Power to Fly. It's truly an honor. Thank you, Rob, for asking me to share about that and how I can help. And if you guys want, if y'all want um, help, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's just my name. Or you can go to quill, like a writing pen, dot life. That's a website. You can actually have a dot life. Isn't that fun? Quill.life is my website. You can also reach out there.